What's going on, folks? It's your boy here again, Dr. Sean Thomas, back in the building for episode 28 of the Be More Today show. We're back, we're back, we're back in the building, and summer is coming to an end. Oh, so sad to see summer quickly moving past us, but excited that the Be More Today continues to go on, and my quotation for today is always simple, just for you. It says, nothing in life is to be feared, only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less by Marie Curie. I don't know about you guys, folks, but I have used this year to learn a lot about a lot of things I didn't know about. We've had a a number of chances with COVID-19 to take time, Um, time to learn more about ourselves, about other people, about what we stand for, what we believe, what we don't believe, all these things. And um, I truly believe that the more that we learn about certain things, the better we are as a people, um, as a generation, uh, as a culture, as a country, et cetera. But it takes us time to do that. We have to go out there and get out of our comfort zones and learn more about other people. Um, I think it's a disservice when people kind of stay in their own networks, right? You don't really go out there and recognize the beauty of life that you can see when you see so many people around you doing so many great things. So use this time if you have not already, because we still have more time in this year before 2020 is done. It's been a crazy year, I know. Uh, But use this time to go out there and learn something new about yourself or about somebody else. And I guarantee you, you would be blessed by the experience, be blessed by the opportunity. And some of the things that you may have thought about somebody or something might not be true. Uh, It takes time to really go out there and recognize once you see somebody else that what you thought was right might be completely wrong. So nothing to fear out there, folks. Get out there, learn more about somebody else, about something new in your life, and together we will be more today. Folks, my guest for today is uh, super special to me. She's a longtime friend from the best school in the country, Brown University. Bruno, you know. Her name is Sayreen Noor Ali, and she is the co-founder of Sleuth. A venture back to start up with, which helps parents access pediatric health information from parents like them for children like theirs. She's an award-winning growth strategist who started her career at the U.S. Department of State as a public servant and diplomat, helping executive President Obama's initiatives in entrepreneurship, education, and innovation in the Middle East and South Asia. She is a startup advisor, founder of EdTech Women, on the advisory board for South by Southwest EDU, and not least, a mom of two little girls. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, pets included, please welcome to the stage <laughs> my friend from Brown University, as you know, Sayreen Noor Ali. Sayreen, what's going on? It's so good to be here, Sean. Um, do you realize that this week, I've known you since, I think it's been like 22 years. Yeah, yeah. I was just looking at the, um, President Paxton is doing her- 21 years, yeah. Yeah, she's doing her commencement or invocation speech today for school, because school starts today at Brown. And wow. Yeah, we met literally- uh, 21 years ago. Yeah, 21 years ago. Um, it's so crazy that time, literally- just keeps moving, but it seems like, it feels like yesterday we were just walking on the campus, going to the Bamical Gates, and, you know, it's, know. it's just so good to connect with you. I feel bad because we're both in New York, um, and I feel like we both are just so busy, 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 but I'm glad that we can at least connect on on this medium. So thank you so much for taking time out from your busy schedule um, to talk to me. Likewise, it's great to reconnect. Uh, we are all in the busy phase of life, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, And for those who don't know, you know, Sammy and I actually, we connected um, quickly at school. You know, people at school, you you connect with with various people, you know, throughout activities and um, people who live in your dorm, et cetera. We lived um, in close proximity dorm wise, but we had a mutual friend, Poonam, um, who (laughs) kind of introduced us to each other and and we we kicked it off instantaneously. And, you know, I, I look back at our friendship at Brown and you know, there are many times where you held me down. Like you were a solid friend, a solid rock for me. Um, 
throughout many of the challenges that come, you know, as, as we were growing up, you know, being 18, 19, 20, whatever, um, just recognizing that, uh, you know, people come and go, but your, your friendship with me and our friendship together, I, I think was something that I really appreciated. You were a solid foundation for me. Uh, during my 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 growing mm-hmm. years at, in school, so I appreciate your friendship and um, all the things you did for me as as a friend, as a person, and our times at Brown. I really do appreciate it. That's really sweet. <laughs> Likewise, I I I kind of look at you guys and you and Pi, and I'm like, even though we're not in touch a lot, I'm like, I really admire the both of you. I think one thing there's like so much integrity to your work, and it's so inspiring. And I hope you know that from afar and as an old friend like I have even more respect for you now like do you know what I mean it's like even though we're not in touch it just kind of grows yeah um and I have to say you were a lot of fluorescent fleece my friend in the 90s in 2003 (laughs) every time I think about you on campus it's like this really tall man with a lot of fluorescent green fleece do you remember that (laughs) For folks who don't know, I like, wore a there's lot of Sean. Yeah. There's Sean. A lot of yellows and oranges and neon greens in school. So um He was great. Yeah, I was, I was very much seen a lot, but uh <laughs> I do You have were some, trying to be seen. Uh, I have some of those things still and, and my wife does not like me to hold on to them, but I keep them in a small <laughs> closet, small corner. Just in case it's like a 90s party I have to get to, I'm ready to rock, you know? <laughs> there you go. That should be your guys' first party after all this is over. Exactly. COVID-19 is done. 2021, 90s party in my house. Save the day. <laughs> yep. Totally. So say I like checking in with people and see what's going on. Um, I know COVID-19 has been insane for everyone. Uh, what's your current situation now with COVID-19, your family, uh, work, et cetera? How are you guys doing? We're good. We're holding up. Um, I think we stayed in New York. Uh, our loyalty to New York keeps growing, even though my husband and I are not, like neither of us originally from here. Um, but we had a lot of conversations about like what is good for a family and we keep coming back here. So that means a lot. We had to do a lot of introspection. Um, but we are, we're very lucky. I think after I think New York will be slightly different I I feel it kind of like the people who you know are here there's just this kind of camaraderie Mm -hmm. you know like everyone is the veneer of New York where there's kind of like the show off East part or like the keeping up with the Joneses part I feel that that is kind of weakening and there's more of a like let's be in it together yeah um which I which I really appreciate yeah yeah No, I agree with that. I think that we're going to see a whole new uh, world after we come back from all this stuff. So the way things are going now with COVID-19, now we're coming out of it, especially for New York, because we've we've done a good job, I think, at least coming out of it. Um, We'll see how things really pan out moving forward. Um, Yeah. So I know you began your career um, as a U.S. diplomat, and I want you to talk about that walk, because a lot of people on on the show have never seen... To this point, uh, anyone who's done the work that you've done. So um, what was that like as a public servant and diplomat? Uh, and what was your educational background to get to that position? Yeah. Um, so I entered the State Department through a fellowship program. And uh, that fellowship program, like we were civil servants, but we also got to do diplomatic uh, tours of duty to different countries. So I went to Paris, Nepal, and then Dubai. Um, so it was a eye opening experience um, in the sense that as soon as you are representing the United States in a different country, you're already an elite. And so to be perceived as an elite is really quite interesting. There's a lot of things that you're afforded as a, as a diplomat. Um, and it was fun, you know, like to meet other ambassadors and other government officials. It was a really eye opening experience into how policy comes down or like it comes down to relationships and how strong those relationships are between two governments and the relationship building that you keep having to do with this really interesting situation where diplomats change every four years in a new country. So like, how do you keep these two countries relationship strong when there's kind of just high turnover and repeated turnover. 
Um, so it's very complex. I think one thing that um, I learned while being at the State Department is just how nuanced the work is that people might not appreciate outside. It, it does very much feel like a black box, like diplomacy, until you're kind of in it. Um, so I have a couple of experiences where um, while I was representing the United States, people in the countries where I served did not consider me American because I was not white. Um, and it ended up being both beneficial and detrimental, right? Like you don't want to be seen as less than at the same time, it gave me access in a way and trust in a way that my white colleagues didn't get right. Like in Nepal, people was like, I'm South Asian, people from Nepal are South Asian. And so there was like a little bit more opening to me. Um, but this is a conversation that is now happening more and more within the State Department about like, how do you get more representation of what the U.S. is within, dip, you know, the you know, diplomatic force, right? Because like that is the face of the country. Um, so I, I learned, I learned a lot of stuff that I could only learn there. Does that make, does that make sense? Like yeah. it's not... You know, just because people, you, you don't get to read a lot about diplomacy in the news. Um, I was wiki leaked, which was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> it wasn't that exciting um, in terms of what I wrote about. And the educational path that took me here was I spent two years sort of studying um, religions of the Middle East and South Asia. And then I did a master's in education and I'd really intended to do international development work. But that year, um, the government, the U.S. government wasn't hiring for international development. And so fortunately, I got in the State Department. And so I ended up taking a turn and doing more foreign policy work than development work. Hmm. Now, is this something that you always wanted to do? Because I remember in school, you studied a lot of like, um, you know, foreign policy stuff, but was it something that you always saw yourself being? No, <laughs> not at all. Okay. Um, I, I guess I always saw myself doing international work, um, but I never saw myself doing um, diplomacy. Like I always thought I would be on the ground working with um populations to build up education and infrastructure. And so diplomacy actually felt a lot more removed to me than I had expected I would be doing. Um, but it was kind of, you know, like a lot of things in all of our lives, it was kind of a fortuitous turn because I didn't plan it. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Um, so, I mean, as a result of that, you've had the opportunity to work with President Obama on his initiative for entrepreneurship, education, innovation in the Middle East and South Asia. What was that like? And did you actually get yeah. a chance to meet my guy, Barack Obama? <laughs> yeah, I did. And I have a like, great picture. Well, it's not a great picture. It's actually really blurry. Um, and I remember meeting him and just like, I lost all my words. Like it's, I, I'm not even really sure what I said. Um, but it was actually really interesting. So I worked with the under the Bush administration and the Obama administration. So it was a huge turn in terms of what it felt like to work under the Obama administration, which tends to be a little bit more open mm -hmm. in the way it approached, um, you know, kind of like Muslim countries is really what I worked on. Um, and what I really appreciated was like the renewed energy that people brought that, you know, whether it was like a political appointee or just people who joined the government at the time, there was a lot of sense of like, we can make change and we can push the envelope and the presidential entrepreneurship summit, which was the first one ever. And now it's still going on, even under a new administration felt very, um, new in the sense that like government and technology and business could all be under the same roof. I think we take that for granted right now when we think about technology, but I was at the state department at a time where like Twitter was just taking off and like Jack Dorsey had a small meeting of people who worked on Iran and I worked on Iran at the time. And it was kind of mind blowing that you could use these tools for different foreign populations to connect with each other. Mm -hmm. And so I really look back at that time and see that as, wow, it wasn't always like that. You know, like we didn't all have smartphones. We weren't all able to connect with like family members abroad through WhatsApp. And like that does inform business today and diplomacy today in a way that 
only really started in the early 2000s, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, and, you know, President Obama really drove a lot of that. Like he, he wanted us to be creative. And I think you need that top down leadership to like give you kind of permission to experiment. Hmm. Do you feel like we're still going in that direction currently, or you think times are changing um, with the current administration and with the future administrations that will be elected in the next couple of months? Hopefully. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that the questions we have are more kind of ethical, moral questions um, about how do you use technology? Like, how do you use it for civic engagement? Uh, and I think, interestingly, because of so many of the political changes in the past four years, the work that we did to maybe, like, you know, help support democratic movements abroad are actually now us looking at ourselves, right? right? We're like, how do we support democracy amongst our right. own population when things feel like they're fraying? And um, we always needed to do that. I think, you know, it, it kind of, you know, like when you work for the government, you, you stay on the page. You cannot say anything against the executive branch because you work for the executive branch. So you don't really get to talk about your opinions um, because your opinions are the opinions of the president. Your opinions are the opinions of the state department. But one of the opinions I did have was that like we have so much democracy strengthening to do in our own country and we're telling other people how to do it. And that made me feel really uncomfortable um, because while we have a really engaged civic, I think the biggest strength of our country is that people are civically engaged. Mm. Like when I worked in the Middle East, of course you have vibrant civil societies but the structure in which to do engagement isn't as strong, right? So like you think about the crisis that we're doing now, like there are mutual aid societies that are popping up. There are artists that are coming out um, and, you know, doing artistic forms of protest. There are protests. And so that infrastructure, we have a history of the infrastructure and it's not perfect, uh, you know, at all. But the history and the exercise of that muscle is kind of can be a muscle memory. Whereas like civic engagement in other countries because they may have a different governing structure is still new. So like when I lived in Dubai, for example, I was trying to keep an eye out just out of my own interest and like, what does civic engagement look like? And it's, it's easier in the U S but we still need to do so much reflecting and building on our own country. And I think that like, to go back to your question, like, I think it's this, I think we get to do that for ourselves now, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think it's a valid yeah, point. You know, yeah. I, it's funny because <laughs> talking about communication and, 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 you know, cell phones and what have you, I remember I got my first cell phone when I actually knew you in, you know, 1999. Uh, yeah. And I've had the same number since then. But um, it's just funny recognizing, you know, we, we, we got through so many times without cell phones, you know, actually keeping our word and being certain places. And now with technology, everything is out there. Everyone's saying something. Everyone can have a voice. Everyone can say their opinion yeah. in various ways. You can share information so quickly. Um, even things that are happening internationally are so quickly transferred, you know, from house to house because everything is at our fingertips. But even with that, like you said, we still have so much work to do in terms of using that technology for, for good and, and giving people a real uh, infrastructure where we can uh, be democratic in that same environment. Um, it doesn't yeah. always happen here perfectly, especially in the U.S. Our history here is not the best. Um, but I, I, I agree. I, I think that we, we still have work to do. And for us to even go anywhere else and say that you should be doing this when we're not doing it ourselves here, you know, that, that, that's definitely an issue. So, um, yeah. I think the work you're doing is, is, is admirable. And, um, I, I think anyone who can, who can combat the, uh, challenges that they may face representing our country in other countries, knowing that our country is not always representative of the people who live in that country. Yeah. Um, but for you to still stand for that country and represent that country is admirable. So I, I, I give you the biggest salute for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you. So besides being a diplomat, you've gone on to do amazing things with this company called Sleuth. And you're the co-founder of Sleuth. 
can you talk to me about what exactly it is and what what's inspired you to take this journey for this this path yeah so after I left the State Department, I moved to New York for love. Well, actually, my husband moved to New York for us. He moved okay. from London. <laughs> so I moved uh, I moved to New York from D.C. And I had to change careers. And I was actually honestly super excited. I was kind of um, ready to move on from the government. And so after a bit of a struggle, I ended up in technology. So I ended up in education technology and then worked in it for five years and really enjoyed it and did well. Um, and I ended up having to leave my job in 2018 because um, my daughter had a medical condition. And so we were trying to figure out what was going on. It was kind of it was kind of a surprise. It wasn't a very obvious situation that we were in. And in the year that I took off trying to figure out like what kind of care she needed, I realized that a lot of parents of children who have medical kind of challenges don't have good information at their fingertips. Um, and, you know, pediatricians generally are trained on acute issues like the flu. Um, or like if you, you know, if your child gets hurt, then you can go there and get the kind of triage care that you need. But it, when it comes to kind of things like development, pediatricians have a protocol of waiting and seeing that often ends up leading into a misdiagnosis for kids where you shouldn't be waiting and seeing. And so I met a lot of parents who were in the middle of like not getting information for their child from their pediatrician and not being able to get the right information on the internet. Cause anytime you Google something on the internet, you kind of end up in this black hole and then you hear like worst case scenario and it's very, very anxiety inducing. Um, and then parents look for other parents. And so that is an actually interesting resource, right? Because like you trust, you trust what another parent says, especially if you know the parent, like if I, right. It's like, I would trust your opinion on like schools, right. Because I know you and we probably have the same kind of thing that we're looking at for our children in all dimensions. Right. And so a lot of parents went on Facebook groups to say, what should I do? Um, what doctor should I go to? What therapies should I get? What do I do about school? And so what we're saying at Sleuth is like the parent is an expert in their child and that expertise of their child's medical journey is going to help someone else. And so we exchange and we um, help parents exchange information in a way that lets someone know what to do next. Um, while removing what, you know, Facebook groups have this, uh, I guess, scary part where people can bully each other, you know? And so, like, if you see some mom groups or parent groups, sometimes it can be really difficult places to engage because there's a lot of judgment. And so we are also helping make sure that what we're focusing is on the information exchange, mm -hmm. almost, right, and take away that part that can be really hard. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I mean, the fact that you saw a need, that not just you experienced personally, but that others were seeing as well. And then you went out there and basically filled the gap for that need. I mean, that, that's, that's, if, if we all did that as people, I think we, we'd have so many less problems in the world, but the fact that you actually did it and are doing it in a way that's effective and successful. I mean, that just gives you more credit for, you know, the, the great person that you are. So, um, you. Did, did you find any, um, Anything challenging in, in that journey in terms of starting this? And did you find any, any, any not, not, not confrontations, but any parents that, you know, looked at you differently for doing this or, or for leaving your job that you were doing to, to take this venture? Yeah, a lot. I, I think most of the judgment comes from me, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's like myself against myself. But I think the biggest, so it's, it's interesting. It's like, I mean, I, you are a person that believes in the divine, right? And like, I kind of, I feel comfortable sharing this with you and your audience because I assume the same thing. Like to me that this is kind of like, it's what I should be doing, right? And so because it's what I should be doing, there's a certain flow that I've been fortunate to like have with it in terms of like finding an, ama finding an amazing co-founder, 
Alex leads, like getting, um, you know, pre-seed investment so that we can actually put out a product and just being generally re- being received really well, even by the parents that we talk to. So like, yeah. that's one part of it. The second part of it is like my own anxiety, uh, which is, I realized actually pretty real. Um, so one thing that I think about a lot is like, am I saying too much about my daughter? You know, like my family is very private. Um, uh, but it also is important to me that I represent that, like, I get it, like I've lived it and I get it. But what's more important is that I try to help, um, destigmatize what it means to have a child who may be atypical for literally any reason. Mm. Right. And so like, it doesn't matter if your child is asthmatic or has food allergies is or autistic, like that parent from what I've, you know, seen and heard from parents, like that parent has anxiety and is not very seen. Right. And so we are trying to broaden the umbrella of the kinds of parents that we know that we can help. And that's, there's no term for that. You know, there's a term for like a child, we kind of say, we can say a child who has special needs, a child who has special health care needs. And each of those terms I learned the hard way is infused with different biases and meanings. And so some, some parents will tell me, I never use the word, I never use the phrase special needs. And other parents will tell me like, yeah, of course, like that's like an appropriate term. And like, you know, we use it and, and I wish more people understand that it's not a bad thing. And obviously I agree with that as well. Um, but I've noticed that when we talk about our startup in a certain way, like some people turn on and some people turn off. And that's because of the bias around phrases around children who have atypical needs. And so like that gives me a lot of anxiety because it's a very, it's like, how do you stand? How do you stand in the way that you want to stand? And how do I, it's hard for me to be a voice. I I find like I have huge imposter syndrome when it comes to it. And, and so like I have imposter syndrome, so I could own my story, but what part of my story is me talking about my daughter? Mm. Yeah. And so it's a lot of conflict in my head. (laughs) Yeah, no, I see that. Um, I I have no words. I'm just really, it's as a, as a parent, um, you know, I, I can't imagine what that's like, but as a parent who may have a, a child who fits in that category, um, the work that you're doing, I think, is, is just remarkable. Um, and I, I do think that a lot of parents would benefit from your story, of course, um, but I can also recognize the, um, the need for your daughter to tell her own story at some point in time and the need for your family yeah. to have that, that privacy. Um, especially, you know, as people of color, our stories have been out there in various ways all the time and twisted and turned around. So um, I think it is a thin line and that, that you versus you that you talked about is something that I can relate to. Um, but I think you're handling it the, the, the right way. So um, yeah. I'm just remarked. I'm just really like in all of the startups that you've done. Um, and the stars that you've done across various um, categories, like professions. Um, so now you're saying that you also do startup tech advice. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of you right now. I'm not really sure like, <laughs> how, how you do all these things and you do them so well. So there's something that you called ed tech. What is ed tech exactly for our listeners who are, yeah. who are watching right now? So <clears throat> education, education technology. So it's like, the way that education is um, kind of enabled by technology so that in the world that we're living in right now, for example, where so many of our children are homeschooled, it's the technology behind that. And so that was a market that was growing already, but now because of COVID-19 yeah. is growing at a rate that no one has ever seen before. But I will say, like, I... You know, I've, I've always worked in this space where it feels like, how do you get information, better information to people sooner? And so, like, I did that in education, and now I'm doing it in this space. But I do have to say that one of the things that really disappointed me a lot about ed tech was its lack of understanding of equity. Hmm. And that is one of the reasons that I was, um, I kind of, I kind of was fine to leave, you know, like, I... You know, I, I saw a, um, 
um, an advertisement for a session that's coming up on education technology. And it's like, um, it's a panel and like, it's also about bringing more like uh, black entrepreneurs into the conversation. One of the people that's on uh, as a speaker in the guy that I want to talk to about a really, really interesting job. And one of the reasons I did not take the job was because he told me that the only education that is worth um, building as an entrepreneur is the one that has a really strong business model and can make a lot of profit. And I was like, I got to get out of here. Like, if you are telling me that it, because his point was like anything else is inefficient and therefore inherently there's no quality to it. And in my mind, I was like, education is a public good. It is a human right for everybody. And like that mentality is bringing, is exacerbating the haves and the have nots when it comes to education. It's like, it's not a public education outlook. And it was like, I had these conversations with a lot of kind of, Anyways, a certain type of demographic of an entrepreneur. And I was like, okay, I think, I think I need a break for a second to regroup. And now with our own startup, like I think about that a lot, like what does equity look like in how we serve parents? Um, and I have to say it's complicated because when you're going out for venture capitalist money, when you, you got to show profit. Like you got to show that like in a certain amount of time, you're going to make money. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times the people that I want to serve, I don't really want their money. Right. Like if I'm going to serve a certain a parent who may not have access to information in the same one, I'm just much more concerned about how are you going to access the information? Mm -hmm. But I don't want anyone ever telling me don't work for that parent. Right. So like when I talk to an investor, it's kind of like, yes, I'm going to make money. Yes, I will make money with this. But you also have to understand that I'm broadening my audience a lot in terms of people. Can we help? And then the way that we think about it is like when we do it, like I can't do it now. Right. Like I have to have a business model. I have to make money. And then as we grow and grow the company, then we can think about how do we make our umbrella even wider in terms of socioeconomic diversity hmm. or even in terms of racial diversity, one of the things I had an interesting conversation with this woman who is the head of um, a nonprofit that serves families of children who are black and autistic. And she was like, listen, we're not giving you our stories. <laughs> and I was like, no, I get it. Like, you're not, I, you, I totally get it. I understand that like the intersection of race and the medical system is often very fraught. Um, and so part of it was like, well, what could we build in the way in our product that over time we can start to build trust? Like, what can we signal and what we can build in? And like, that's a long process. Like, I'm not, I, I can't, I can't do it overnight, but like, these are things that when I try to have a conversation in ed tech, people were like kind of patting me on my head. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a thin line. And uh, I, I think that the fact that everything you're doing is about education. Um, you're, you've been successful in all those realms and you're going get, to get feedback, I think, from anyone who, like I said in my beginning quotation, that fear <laughs> that kind of comes in and it, yeah. it, it, it holds us back from moving forward and from sharing. Um, but I think as long as you continue to educate people on how things are going to be shared and give them the the tools to recognize that safe spaces are still out there, um, that you can educate others in an environment that's going to be beneficial for everyone involved, including the person who actually wants to learn from stuff. And again, like you said, like, everything is not always about money. Um, I think a lot of this year for COVID-19, we've seen that capitalism is that thing um, that we put over everything, even in terms of our health care. Um, you see places that have opened up, regardless of meeting the standards for health guidelines when you've seen people recognizing that they're trying to make more money even when people are not paying and recognizing that they will risk whatever it takes to get people in the door whether they're positive or negative mask on mask off you know there's so many things that capitalism has trumped um no pun intended uh but those, <laughs> things, those things have really yeah. challenged people's you know their their morals their values about what's most important yeah. 
And, you know, is it more important for us to make that dollar? Is it more important for us to stay healthy? Is it more important for us to make that dollar or to educate others who might not be able to afford those things, but that can benefit from the education anyway? And how can we get that to them without, you know, breaking our pockets so that you can still eat, they can still learn something, et cetera. It's a very thin line. I think it's seen not just in your profession, but in all professions, um, whether you're yeah. talking about the educational system or, you know, physical therapy, you, you'll, you'll see it. And um, I think just we as people need to be better with recognizing our priorities. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I think that, we're going to have to, but it has to be like almost rewritten. Yeah. Like, the, like, right. Like the framework of capitalism that we have now, it's not, you can only push it so much in its current form. Right. You know? Right. Uh, and it's even, like, how do you, yeah. Yeah, even, even if yeah. you and I have the conversation for, for hours, you know, and what we want to do, those who may be above us who have the, the more power than we may to really change those things, yeah. are they going to do that? No. If it doesn't from, come from the top, will it ever happen from the bottom? I don't know. But yeah, I think the whole, the whole system. Yeah. The whole system. I read this really interesting model. I think, I think it started by the founder of 4.0 Schools. Hmm. And it's, it's the idea that like there's a lot of philanthropy money that is not representative of um, basically just like the U.S., right? And so it's training um, Black professionals to be philanthropists. And it's a longer-term model, but it's like that is – and it's not – that's not even that radical of a model, but it's actually kind of like I read about it and I was like, this is so obvious. Like more of us should be doing this. Like of course you train people – who have a touch point into their own individual communities, those are the people that should be deciding how the money is used. Mm. And in my head, I was like, this, you know, this guy who designed it, I, I don't remember his name, but it's like, that's so genius. But it's also something that all of us could probably think about doing in our own realm in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, and it was, it, was really, it was really inspiring to think about how things can be flipped on its head. Yeah, yeah. I, I I want to check that out whenever we're done with the call. I'll, I'll check it out and you can share that information with me, educate me on that. Um, last question before the break. So what what's the Southwest? South, South by Southwest. Southwest. Yes. What is this uh, South by Southwest EDU board that you're a part of? Yeah. The so South by Southwest Interactive started as um, like this, conference in Austin for innovation and media and a lot of people launched a new product and then they came up with one for education and so I sit on the board trying to vet applications where they're like startup accelerator um, they have a commitment to um, diverse representation sort of sending them names of people and trying to get people in the pipeline I, I always have a subversive agenda to get more people <laughs> like everything a little bit to shake things up a little bit and so yeah. this um, advisory role is nice to be able to do that. That's incredible. That's incredible. For those of you just joining us now, this is my friend, Sari Nor Ali, episode 28 of the Be More Today show. And she is the co-founder of Sleuth. Uh, she's also a startup tech advisor and has been through everything from being a diplomat to a mother of two. And, you know, Sari, I don't know how you balance all these things. Uh, you're kind of like me in the sense that you do a lot of things. Now, when I was at, at Brown, I did a lot of things, as you know. I was like all over the place. Yeah, you know, because you're like, yo, where are you going now? <laughs> right, <laughs> What's <that>? exactly. <laughs> what are you yep. doing? Um, but I feel like you have that same spirit of your hands are in everything. And I'm curious how you balance all of that, being a mom of two, being a wife, running all these different um, organizations and advisory boards. How do you balance all these things together? I don't do it very well, got to be honest. Like, I think um, I realized that my body is burnt out. And so, like, I have had to take a couple steps back and reevaluate. And I, I say no a lot more than I used to, um, which is hard, but also freeing. Um, and then there's the part that, like, I kind of like you. It's like, you just kind of like it. Like, could you ever imagine sitting still? I can never imagine Michelle and Thomas sitting still. Like, that would be miserable for you. It would, like, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so part of it is, like, it's just kind of fun to, like, see people and then do work and then do this and do that. And then, I mean, before COVID, 
it was insane. And then I instituted a rule that we do nothing on Sundays. And that was super key. So like if people wanted to come over, we would have people over. That was the one thing. But we didn't go anywhere. We didn't do any extracurricular activities. And like we just chilled. Um, and that was actually pretty cool because it, it didn't take a lot of change in my life. Mm-hmm. Like, well, you're already off on a Sunday. Um, just do that. And so I think the the little things are what keeps me functioning somewhat. Yeah, no, I think it's good. Our our day is Saturday. That's our day just to kind of chill out and say we're not doing this. But yeah, you need that day just to yeah, you need the day. To say no, I, I'm I'm working on saying no more. Um, that's been my <laughs> day. I, I I'm still kind of a yes man, but I'm working on saying no more. But you're right. Yeah. I, it, it, but look how uncomfortable you feel. You just just saying it makes you feel. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, even now I'm on vacation this week, and it's literally like I'm still up at six or five. I'm like, why am I out? What am I doing? <laughs> I can just stop doing <laughs> random things. So it's it's tough. But I think we all need that time to decompress for sure. And we, I need to work on that more. I'm gonna work on that more. I promise. Work on it. I'm gonna work on it. <laughs> um, so. I'm curious, you and I were 18 around the time that we met, and yeah. um, a lot of advice has been shared with us since that time in terms of professionally, um, emotionally, spiritually, relationship, et cetera. What's one bit of advice that you wish someone had shared with you when you were 18 that you wish you had listened to? I know you probably had a lot of advice yeah. I would share with you, but you probably didn't yeah. listen to a lot of it. So what's one thing that I would share with you that you wish that you said, you know what? I wish I had listened to that when you were 18. Yeah. So I, I wish someone had told me to stop looking for permission everywhere I went, because I feel like I would have done all of this before my age right now. Like, Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think my experience as like a person of color who worked in a system that tried to just like be good and go to good schools, right? It's kind of like you have this framework and you achieve against the framework, but it's still a framework right? Like it's still rigid around you. It's just that you figured out how to be really good at it. And so it took me a really long time up until very recently in the past couple of years, like to stop asking like the network around me of, you know, people who are influential in my network, like for permission to stuff, to do stuff, you know? And I'm like, wait, it's all within me. Like I have, I cannot do this or I could do this. And I think, the startup is the biggest reflection of like me being like, I don't need permission anymore. I mean, I need validation. I mean, I think there's a difference, right? Being able to say, I don't need your permission to go and do something that's kind of radical and start something. Um, But I do need the market validation and people in terms of funders to say like, yes, I think it's a good idea. And so I need the feedback, but I don't need the permission. And I wish I had known that at 18. You know, that's big. I understand that completely. Um, now, Be More Today is my startup, if you will. Um, yep. It's it's our mantra. It's our it's our motto. It's what we're trying to really educate others just to learn from people like you. Um, the motto for this year is ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And although you're not ordinary, you know, anyone can do what you're doing. Clearly, <laughs> we can all do these things. But your extraordinary <laughs> work it's something that really I want to highlight. And um, I'm curious when you hear the phrase be more today, what it means to you or what thoughts come to your mind? Um, you know, because I affiliate that phrase with you, you know, and like what you're building, I always think of your work as being infused with like a, like an element of like spirituality plus kind of like your God given gift. So for me personally, it is to, kind of be more in terms of like my connection to something that isn't the mundane, right? It's like, instead of like obsessing about like what my kids are eating, I think about it being more of a person who connects spiritually. Like it's really important. I think one of the reasons why you and I connected, even though we probably never really talked about it is that we both grew up that way, you know, in terms of like, there's something looking out for you. There's a connection. There's something that you have to give gratitude to. And to me, it's like, I, I, I would like to be more today by doing more of that because it's like such a positive feedback loop as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're right. We, um, 
we connected pretty quickly at school. And, you know, even though it's funny, I, I'll talk about this now. I remember um, when we first got to school, you know, I, I came from a, a very diverse high school and I, I feel like I came to Brown knowing for the most part who I was and what, what I stood for, um, who my friends were, et cetera, wanted to be. And, you know, when we met, I was gravitated towards you because you're just the, ni- the nicest person in the world. Like you're super sweet, you know, Poonam was super awesome, Jess Wong, all these people that we really connected with um, in the first weeks of school, first days of school, really. Right. And, um, you know, the way the cafeteria is set up at, at school, the ratty, right? Um, <laughs> there, there are various places that you can go to, you can eat, you can sit in the corner, you can sit in Little Africa, if you will, where like, all the people of color sit who are African-American, brown, black and brown, et cetera. And I remember not wanting to feel like I wanted or had to be friends with people that my, that people thought I should be friends with, right? So mm-hmm, you know, there's, right. there's a tendency for people to walk into a school and, okay, well, you, you're black. You, the black kids are over there. You got to sit with them, you know, or, you know, you're, you're, you're Muslim. Okay, well, all the Muslim students are going to be over here on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, or you're Puerto Rican. Yep, they sit over there on, on the left side. And right. I think it's a natural tendency for us to migrate towards those groups initially off the bat, clearly, because you want that sense of comfort. But at that time in my life, I didn't really feel like I needed that because I knew where I was, knew what I stood for. Um, and I connected with people who I just liked as people who, you know, wh- whatever they were um, and wherever they came from. And, you know, when, when I connected with, with you and, and everyone else, we used to eat lunch literally almost every day together for the longest time. Um, I would yep. sometimes get flack from other people being like, oh, you're not sitting with us. What's going on? Like, <laughs> I remember this. Yeah. I, totally remember I, this. I remember having yeah. a conversation with you about this, recognizing that although it was crazy that the conversation was happening, I can understand why people would see that or say that because to them, they needed that. They needed that connection. They needed that, that sense of community. And to them, it may have looked like I was not trying to be a part of that. And yeah, then I, also right. I should have been a part of that. And I remember sometimes sitting with, you know, people that uh, I felt like I had to sit with or should be sitting with. And you yeah. actually were the one who was like, yo, what's going on? Um, and, and that's why I said, you know, it really goes back to you being a foundational piece for me because um, you were there to, to kind of sift through my transitions through, okay, well, this is who I am, but that's who I think I should be, or that's who maybe I want to be, or the people around me think I should be. And I think we all go through these phases of, of growth and process. And um, it's just, it's just cool now to see the growth that we've all gone through to recognize yeah. that that doesn't even matter anymore. Like it's really about who you are as a person and who your friends yeah. are back. And um, we're all the same, you know, we're all kind yeah, of different. So we're all kind of the same as well. So yeah. um, it's the beauty of life. And I think the circle, like you said, that circle of life is, is something that I appreciate. And be more today for me is that. It's really about yeah. being together and recognizing that we all can be more today if we just learn more from each other. The way you're educating the rest of the world that you're doing, educate others on that same kind of stuff. So um, I wrote this book, Sayreen, called um, Be More Today. Actually, it's a 40 day guide to a better version of you. And in the book, we talk about these steps to greatness. And the steps are really things that I encourage people to start doing, stop doing, and goals they have for their lives. So I know yeah. it's been a crazy year, um, <laughs> but I was curious if, that's my dog. <laughs> I was curious if there was something that you wanted to start this year doing or have already started doing this year. Oh, well, then, I, it, I, then it's to meditate. I think to go back to link it to your previous question. I mean, I, I think it's, it's like me against myself again. Like I know I need it and I still don't do it. I haven't figured out what that's about. Um, but definitely to start meditating or have some kind of daily reflective practice. Cool. What's one thing that you want to stop doing this year? Oh, 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 one thing I want to stop doing this year. Um, I actually, I feel like, I, well, there's something that I have, like, I definitely have recognized that I have low level anxiety. Uh, I would like that to be, I would like to decrease it. I don't, but I'm also like in a place in my life where I don't criticize, I've stopped criticizing myself too, too much. So I'm not going to make myself feel bad about having it. Like it's COVID there's a level of anxiety everywhere. Um, so 
dealing with it. I would like to stop not dealing with it. <laughs> Got it. Got it. That works. And then this one goal that you may have had for 2020. That I've had and I had to stop or like I'm still trying to um, do One thing that you want to get done this year that either you were looking towards or working towards or still trying to get towards for the rest of this year. Well, a huge goal is that we're um, trying to get our next round of funding for Hello Sleuth. Um, and so I still have my eye on the prize. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So if you're an investor out there, uh, this is the investment you want to give your money to folks. Um, <laughs> you heard it here first on the Be More Today show. <laughs> so Irene, any, any final tips you want to share with um, parents who are in your situation? Any startup tech advice you want to share? Diplomatic advice you want to share or anything that's in your realm yeah. of expertise. You have so many things that you've you give back to the world in terms of your 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 knowledge base. So any final tips you yeah. want to share with the audience? Well, I I would just love to offer myself as like a person to connect with if there is a parent who feels kind of unheard or unseen in their journey with their child. Um, I hear that a lot that parents are lonely. So I'm always here for support. I think in the startup um, world, one thing that I wish more people would do is, oh, Sean? I'm so here. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, I think I think more people probably are sitting on a really interesting idea um, based on their life experience. So I would just encourage people not to discount what they know. Mm. Mm. That's powerful words, folks. Say, where can people find you? Where can they connect with you on social media or otherwise? Yeah, the, the best place is Instagram. I'm also trying to grow it. Um, it's my full name, at Sarene Norley, and then um, at Hello Sleuth as well. I manage both those accounts. So awesome. I would love to hear from people. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show, Sarene. You have made episode 28 perfect. Um, I have no other <laughs> Thank words you to for say having me. It's just been so good to reconnect with you. And I'm going to be a better um, advocate for making sure that we hang out more in New York. Uh, once Amen. We're to, I know, right? Amen. Yes. Once we're allowed to do that and, and, and get out there, I'm going to make sure that I, I make my way towards you. And again, we're going to hopefully have uh, school in the city. So if that all works yeah, well, exactly. then I will be able to see you more. But I really appreciate that you. That would be awesome. Yeah, so. Thank you for having me. Not a problem at all. And for those who are listening, thank you so much for tuning into our show. Our quotation for today, again, is from Rhea Curie, which says, nothing in life is to be feared. It's only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more that we may fear less. Uh, and you heard it from Serene Noralia by herself. She is educating so many on so many things. So let's fear less. Let's learn more and keep moving together. Uh, the Be More Today platforms are, are mostly on Facebook and Instagram. You can follow us there on Be More Today. Please follow us and subscribe. Our webpage is bemoretoday.com. You can go there for our book information, music information, our podcast information. We have two of them, as you guys know. Worst Flight uh, comes on Wednesdays and Be More Today show every single Monday morning. And for those of you who are looking to get your workouts in, please watch us on uh, YouTube. Our YouTube page is active, and we'll show our websites for all the shows that we've been doing along with our workouts as well. So go onto our YouTube page and see that our shower page is growing. If you are on Strava and you want to be a part of the Be One Today family, join us on Strava for all the workouts. Whether you're a runner or a biker, we'll have you on there. You can be part of our big Be More Today group. Uh, join the madness, join the fun. You'll see me out there trying to get my miles in. And for the month of September, actually, we're doing this nine for nine challenge, which basically means all we want you to do is run nine miles. That's it. Nine miles for the month of September, nine miles per week. In addition to that, you should be doing nine reps of anything you want to do. So nine jumping jacks, nine burpees, nine push-ups, anything you want to do. It's called nine for nine challenge. So you can get on there and hop on with us. That would be fantastic. The more today's show is actually now heard in 14 countries. So we are heard in the U.S. and 13 countries. So we thank you so much for your support. And if you want to support us financially, which you always like, uh, this is the board box page on our page. So anything you want to give us is really appreciated. We thank you for our supporters who are giving currently. We thank you so much for your love and support. It is not unnoticed. 
And for those of you who want to sponsor anything in terms of your advertisements, your businesses, your small companies, you want to give out your information, we are doing sponsorships now for the rest of this quarter. So if you want to advertise your product on Be More Today show, send me an email at bemoretoday at gmo.com. That's be more the number two day at gmo.com or any of our social media platforms as well. As I always say, folks, have a good day. Have a good night. Have a great life. And continue to take your steps to greatness to be the best version of you. Peace. Living life with nothing to prove.